But if you think about what is one of the most visible mechanisms of creating ritual in our world, it's the British royal family. This is about a business that is at the heart of the fabric of British society. Well, I think there's always been the firm. Welcome to episode two of The Firm, Blood, Lies and Royal Succession, with me, Jonathan Locke. We're taking a journey through five centuries of scandal, intrigue and betrayal in the British royal family, and discovering what unites all of these very different crises is the idea of The Firm, whose sole purpose is the preservation and continuation of the royal brand itself, no matter what the cost. Well, the royal family is, is known as The Firm, but what you have with the firm, you also have what Diana termed the men in the grey suits, which sounds all very ominous. And what these are are basically high-ranking courtiers at Buckingham Palace and Windsor Castle who rule the roost. In the last episode, we examined the current turmoil threatening the stability of the family and how the firm are dealing with accusations of sexual assault faced by the Queen's second son, Prince Andrew. If you start having members of the royal family who are known associates with sex traffickers, then you really are undercutting the sort of brand promise that you stand for integrity and virtue and propriety. Many members of the royal family, including Prince Charles and William, do not want him really back in the firm in any official capacity because they feel he damages the trademark, basically. Essentially, there was a crisis meeting at the palace. Andrew was summoned in, and he was told, this is starting to have wider implications. You're out of public life, and you're out of the royal family. Now we're going to wind the clock back nearly 500 years to the reign of the woman many believe to be Britain's greatest monarch, Elizabeth I, the self-styled Virgin Queen and arguably creator of what we now think of as the royal brand. Her firm was her. She was the top of the food chain. She had her counsel, she had her advisors, but she was the ultimate say. If she didn't like you, she retired you. She wasn't going to be told how it was going to be, she told others how it was going to be. That's the difference between an absolute monarchy and a constitutional monarchy. She had endless power, Elizabeth I. Elizabeth may have had the inherited power of her bloodline, but she wielded that power with keen political cunning and an instinct for creating a public image that would shame many modern spin doctors. She understood the value of good public relations. She consciously fostered this idea of the mask of youth and the goddess, the undying goddess. So this is where she gets the title, the Virgin Queen. It's not because she didn't sleep with anyone at all. We know that she had affairs. It was all part of her mythology. The woman who would become England's Virgin Queen was born in 1533, the third surviving child of Henry VIII. Henry had ruled for 38 years, first as a strong, powerful king, but in later years morbidly obese, riddled with disease, and remembered chiefly for the murders of two of his six wives. One of those wives, Anne Boleyn, was Elizabeth's mother. She had a very bad start in life because her mother, Anne Boleyn, was beheaded uh, on the orders of her father, Henry VIII, when Elizabeth was only two years and eight months old, and she was declared a bastard and excluded from the royal succession. Not a great advantage with which to be starting life. Anne Boleyn was Henry's second wife and had been executed for high treason on charges of adultery, incest and plotting to kill the king. Most modern historians find it unlikely that she was guilty at all. Here's Jacqueline Roth, executive editor of theroyalobserver.com. Anne was by no means a saint. Let's not forget she enticed the king away from his first wife, Catherine of Aragon, but it seems pretty certain that the real reason he got rid of her was because she failed to provide him with the male heir he desperately craved. It sounds horrifying now, and let's be honest, it is horrifying, but the mood at the time was that Anne pretty much deserved it. She was even known as the great whore for having seduced Henry in the first place, not only away from his wife, but away from Catholicism. 
Catherine of Aragon's daughter, Mary, never forgave Anne Boleyn for that and carried that grudge on to Anne's daughter, Elizabeth, too. Elizabeth was only two when her mother was executed, and for the next 12 years, watched as her father worked his way through another four wives before his death in 1547. Of course, Jane Seymour, the woman for who he had Anne beheaded, died in childbirth just a year after her marriage. She was followed by Anne of Cleves, who lasted six childless months before he divorced her, Catherine Howard, who managed a year before also being executed for treason, and finally Catherine Parr, who actually outlived the king. There's an old rhyme they teach in history class in Britain about Henry's wives. Divorce, beheaded, died, divorced, beheaded, survived. That's what everyone remembers about his marriages. But the really crucial thing is his children. From those marriages, only three children survive infancy. Mary, the eldest, Elizabeth, and Edward, the son of Henry and Jane Seymour. As the male child, Edward, although the youngest, was first in line to the throne. And after Henry's death, he was crowned King Edward VI, age just nine. As he was so young, the country was governed by a regency led by his uncle, Edward Seymour. To make things even more complicated, Henry's widow, Catherine Parr, then married Edward's other uncle, Thomas Seymour. Here's historian Alison Weir, author of The Life of Elizabeth I. Catherine Parr, Henry VIII's final wife, did much to bring Henry and his children closer together and attempt to forge some cohesion in this very dysfunctional family because they're three children from different mothers. And when Henry died, Catherine Parr remarried very quickly. She remarried um, Jane Seymour's brother, Thomas Seymour. Catherine took pity on the 14-year-old Elizabeth and took her into her household. If Catherine's intentions were good, however, her new husband was clearly not so honourable. Seymour showed an interest in Elizabeth. Almost as soon as his marriage was announced, he was visiting Elizabeth's room in the mornings and romping with her, you know, making to tickle her in the bed. And one wonders what his motives were. Did he just fancy this young girl, who at the time was only 14 years old? But we have to remember, of course, this is what nowadays we would see this as child abuse, but in those days, girls were marriageable at 12. So it's a different mindset. But even so, he was married, and it wasn't a good situation, clearly. And so Catherine Parr found out later on and sent Elizabeth away. It got worse. Not only did the teenage Elizabeth have to suffer the unwelcome attentions of a much older man, a man who was supposedly her protector, but after Catherine's death a year later, he even attempted to marry Elizabeth, perhaps as part of a scheme to later take the throne for himself. She refused, and Seymour was arrested for treason. He was beheaded several months later. And Elizabeth, his plans, his designs on Elizabeth became public at this time, and she had to defend herself against all the accusations of treason because she was a princess of the blood and it was treason to marry her without the king's permission. Nothing was proved against her, and the scandal blew over, but it had been touch and go, and she was in a very perilous situation. Edward VI died of tuberculosis in 1533 and surprised everyone by overruling the act of succession and naming his cousin, Lady Jane Grey, as his heir rather than his oldest sibling, Mary. Naturally, Mary was having none of it. Lady Jane Grey lasted just nine days before being deposed by Mary's army and, true to form, was duly beheaded. And she was not the only one to suffer Mary's wrath. The new queen set about purging England of any and all perceived enemies of her crown. Mary reigned for just five years and acquired the nickname Bloody Mary, thanks to her aggressive reinstatement of Catholicism, which Henry had abandoned in order to divorce her mother and marry Anne Boleyn. And when I say aggressive, she had more than 280 high-ranking Protestants, including bishops and archbishops, burned at the stake for their faith. She was the lady who burnt, she was called Bloody Mary later on because she burned nearly 300 Protestant martyrs. Elizabeth had secretly adhered to the Protestant faith through this time. Mary's religious fervor was to prove yet another dangerous trial for the young Elizabeth. After a Protestant uprising was suppressed, Mary's suspicion fell upon the sister she had always resented. Here's royal commentator Richard Fitzwilliams. 
Well, one of the things you, I think, have to emphasize when you talk about Elizabeth the First is the dangerous era in which she lived and ruled. And there's no doubt it was brutal. It was such a desperately dangerous time with religious hatreds so absolutely ferocious. And Elizabeth was suspected, whether justly or not, of being involved in plots against Mary or being suspected of favoring them. And she was interned in the tower. She was under house arrest subsequently for about a year. And it just shows that at that time, it was only by very, very slender margin that she escaped the real possibility that her system might have gone to the uh, excessive lengths of having her executed. There's no question that her whole life was influenced, I think, by that. Elizabeth somehow endured, and in November 1558, Mary died. As Henry VIII's last remaining child, Elizabeth succeeded to the throne aged 25. But if she thought her troubles were over, she was gravely wrong. When she finally did inherit the throne after many fits and starts, she inherited a bankrupt kingdom. You have to remember when she came to the throne in the eyes of Catholic Europe, she was a bastard, a heretic, and this placed her in a very precarious situation. Elizabeth was a Protestant like her father, and although Bloody Mary's religious fanaticism had made Mary deeply unpopular with Protestants, it had also made her a hero of the powerful forces of Catholic Europe. When she came to the throne, most of Europe, of course, remained Catholic, and therefore Elizabeth was regarded as a heretic. And in 1570, the Pope said it was quite lawful for Englishmen to depose her and even assassinate her. Thomas Mace Archer Mills, founder of the British Monarchist Society. She is a queen that lived in fear, and she lived in fear until the day she died of Catholic conspiracy. There were conspiracies against her life. There were assassination attempts against her. She was one that hid behind palace walls and didn't enjoy going out in public because she always felt that she would die, that someone would eventually kill her because they considered her a heretic. She felt under constant threat. Her counsellors were very concerned about her safety and the stability of the realm. Elizabeth's chief threat came from Scotland and a cousin with an eye for the throne. She had not had any relationships with Mary, Queen of Scots until she became queen. And at that point, Mary was then married to the Dauphin, the heir of France. And the French king, her father-in-law, claimed the throne of England on Mary's behalf. And that's when the conflict with Mary, Queen of Scots began. Mary, Queen of Scots was the Catholic ruler of Scotland, and at that time married to the Catholic heir to the French throne. She not only had a claim to the English throne through her father, James V, but she also had the support of pretty much the whole of Catholic Europe. She was a major threat to the new queen. Mary, Queen of Scots, personally, was very keen to become Queen of England. She was more interested in gaining England than in ruling Scotland. Mary intrigued again and again against Elizabeth and made it quite clear that as a Roman Catholic, in the eyes of Catholic Europe, she was the rightful heir to the English throne. And this, of course, Elizabeth perceived quite rightly as a dire threat. The threat from Mary, Queen of Scots, was to be short-lived. By 1567, after the murder of her second husband, allegedly by the man who then became her third husband, the powerful Scottish nobleman had turned against her and she was forced to abdicate in favour of her one-year-old son, James. She fled to England and, in an extraordinary about-face, appealed to Elizabeth for help. That was the most stupid thing she could have done. Why would you appeal for an army to a woman whose throne you have coveted? Elizabeth, the Virgin Queen, did not want to be tainted by association with Mary by receiving her at court. She also realized that she was a very dangerous guest. So she kept her in under house arrest and in prison effectively for 19 years. Mary may have been dethroned, but she was still a very real worry for Elizabeth. Eventually, after keeping her confined for nearly 20 years, the Queen's chief spymaster, Sir Thomas Walsingham, claimed to have uncovered evidence that Mary continued to plot against her cousin. They had a setup whereby she thought her letters were being smuggled out to her friends, 
In fact, they weren't. They were being smuggled out to Sir Francis Walsingham. And in one of them, she, they actually got her to write that to give her approval of Elizabeth's assassination. And Walsingham's decoder actually drew a little gallows on that particular letter as if to say, we've got her. And they had. One of the features of Elizabeth's reign, and this had both pluses and minuses, was the fact that on the one hand, she had the likes of Sir Thomas Walsingham, a spy master, to protect her from plots. The other problem was that there really were plots. Mary, it appears, was set up, but there's little doubt that there was an involvement. Whether or not there really had been a serious plot to assassinate Elizabeth, or if Mary had been framed by Walsingham, continues to divide opinion. But in February 1587, she paid the ultimate price. Executed for treason. It is said that it took three blows of the axe to behead her. I think that it's always been the blot on her reign, or her decision to have Mary Queen of Scots, her cousin, executed because she was a threat. The execution of Mary Queen of Scots can be seen as an example that Elizabeth was not above the kind of brutality shown by her father, but when you look at it through the context of the time, I think she wasn't left with much choice. So long as Mary lived, there would be a prominent Catholic with a strong claim to her throne, living within striking distance of London. Richard Aldrich is an expert in the history of the British intelligence services and the relationship between the royal family and its spy networks. He explains that Walsingham was not the only tool Elizabeth used to protect her and consolidate her position on the throne. Really, her most important source was to have a top, top codebreaker. When we think back to spying during that period, we inevitably think of human spies, we think of people sort of lurking in the shadows in felt hats. But actually, perhaps Elizabeth's most important success against all those kind of attacks by the continent was to have a really good code breaker. So Elizabeth I was not just, if you like, running her own James Bond. She had her own national security agency. She had her own code breakers. And these were absolutely crucial in kind of defeating her enemies, including uh, Mary Queen of Scots. Really under Elizabeth, one of the great skills was, I suppose, relatively straightforward code breaking but using that together with other techniques, human espionage, and I'm sorry to say torture. And Elizabeth I was a great fan of torture as a weapon for security. Elizabeth may have been a woman, but she was damned if she was going to let anyone think her weak because of it. But what Elizabeth also used torture for was to deter other potential enemies. You know, sometimes if one of her enemies was going to be executed, there'd be a long discussion about the nasty stuff that could be done to that person, particularly what would be done to them immediately prior to their execution in full public view. I'm sorry to say Elizabeth was actually quite a ghoulish fan of treating people pretty nastily and doing that in public to deter her enemies. The elimination of Mary, Queen of Scots, may have shown Elizabeth had inherited her father's ruthlessness, but three decades into her reign by then, she was also showing an understanding for politics and the power for creating a lasting public image that the impulsive Henry VIII never had. Here's Richard Fitzwilliams and Alison Weir. There's no doubt at all that she was very, very conscious of her image. So what she did, I mean most particularly, the cultivation of an image, the image of the Virgin Queen, the image where she sacrificed for her country, the image of Gloriana, who was glorious, those portraits. And they're full of symbolism. The symbolism is, is a virginity. She's such only one holding a sieve, which is an emblem of virginity. All the portraits of her are wonderfully grand delinquent. You know, there's sort of the English equivalent, you could say, of the Sun King. I mean, but this was something you know, with practical achievements. You had Elizabeth looking splendid. She did not want to be seen as aging, 
And therefore, she consciously fostered this idea of the mask of youth and the goddess, the undying goddess. The glory of it, I mean, her father, of course, was extremely fond of show, but he was, you could say, a brutal maniac as we would view him. Crucial to what we might call the Queen's brand identity, the portrayal of the Queen as an undying goddess, was her virginity. It could even be argued that a virgin queen, with its deliberate echo of Virgin Mary, the Mother of God, would be the one symbol capable of uniting the warring Catholics and Protestants. She cultivated the notion of being the virgin queen. It became a cult. And it was no accident, actually, because during the Reformation, you know, when Catholicism was swept away, the cult of the Virgin Mary was brought to an abrupt halt in England. It was forbidden. And Elizabeth replaced this with the cult of the Virgin Queen. She became an object of adoration, someone who was seen as, as more than human, who was semi-divine, the goddess Gloriana, Eliza Triumphant. She became almost a goddess to her subjects. Whether or not she was the Virgin Queen she claimed to be has long been a matter of debate, right from the beginning of her reign, it still is today. According to Thomas May Sarcher Mills and Alison Weir, Elizabeth's virginity was not only a calculated brand identity move, but had its roots in the psychological trauma of her childhood. With a mother executed for adultery and then labelled the Great Whore, a father who subsequently worked his way through another four wives, and teenage years subjected to sexual abuse from a man who was supposedly her protector. She was one that never trusted men. She was always manhandled from the time she was young. If it wasn't from her father, it was from her keepers. But then also from her own sister who tried to keep her down. And Mary, Bloody Mary, actually imprisoned Elizabeth in the tower. And it wasn't even known if Elizabeth would leave. Most people at that time who went to the tower never left unless their head was on a spike. So. This woman, this queen, this great queen who was considered the sovereign of the Gilded Age of England at that point was one that always lived in fear and that's why she never really wanted to take a man. And we have to remember that when Elizabeth was eight years old, her stepmother, Catherine Howard, was beheaded for adultery. Had she by then come to equate marriage with risk and death and peril? Because we have to believe not only had our own mother been executed, and she would have known about that by then, but also Catherine Howard had. Her first stepmother, Jane Seymour, had died in childbed. Her fourth stepmother, Catherine Parr, died in childbed. She'd seen the breakdown of marriages within her own family. Marriage to her did not seem a secure state, and I think this is at the root of her fear of it. She was not going to be subservient to the male will in private. She was the Queen of England. Whether it was a masterstroke of public image creation or simply the effects of childhood trauma, there seems little doubt that for a queen who had fought so hard to gain the crown in the first place, the idea of taking a back seat to any man was abhorrent. When she had married, of course, her husband could rule in her name. And she didn't want that. She was determined to retain her autonomy. We have to remember that in this age, this is an age in which men were dominant. Women were seen as inferior creatures, unfit to wield dominion over men. And a female monarch was in some ways seen as an aberration of nature. So you have to remember that, you know, Elizabeth was determined to not fall victim to this prevailing view. But if Elizabeth was resolved never to marry, she was also a smart enough operator to not only hide it, but also to exploit her single woman status for political influence and to keep her enemies at bay. Elizabeth I was someone who was determined, I think, not to marry and to remain a virgin queen. But that didn't mean that she was averse to offering the prospect kind of dangling this prospect in front of other monarchs, other royal families. She was consummate at playing what was called the marriage game, keeping suitors interested where otherwise they might have turned hostile politically. So there were a number of people, both at home and abroad, who nurtured ambitions to marry Elizabeth. She used this very skillfully in a very wily way. 
don't forget, she has the constant threat from Catholic Europe. And in showing herself friendly, in dangling her hand in marriage at European princes, Elizabeth is hoping to keep them friendly and avoid hostilities. Philip was staying with her brother-in-law, and he'd been married to Queen Mary, and he'd shown an interest in Elizabeth money. When Elizabeth came to the throne and after Mary had died, he proposed marriage to her. Well, he was a staunch Catholic and it was never going to work, but she kept him on the string for a little bit. But in the end, that came to nothing. Elizabeth may have kept the likes of Philip of Spain dangling, but at home, rumours circulated about her close friendships with two English noblemen. First of all, Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester, whom she had known since she was a child, and then later, Robert Devereux, Earl of Essex, who also happened to be Dudley's stepson. Elizabeth was a great flirt, and she knew how to captivate men, like her mother, Anne Boleyn. She wasn't conventionally beautiful, but she had what we would call sex appeal. She had charm, and she knew how to play the game to, you know, to the nth degree. She had many suitors, but the foremost among them, and the most enduring, was Robert Dudley, whom she created Earl of Leicester. And there were many rumours that she would marry him. There are those who believe that her real love was the Earl of Leicester. And there's no question that they were tremendously close. If anyone had her heart, it was him. Elizabeth and Dudley had been friends since she was just eight years old, and after she succeeded to the throne, he became a firm favourite, even moving his bedchambers at court next to her own apartments. Were Elizabeth and Robert Dudley in love? Most historians think so. Were they lovers? That's trickier. Dudley had married in 1550, eight years before Elizabeth became queen, and when it looked like she never would. Would he have been so keen to get hitched if he had known she'd one day wear the crown? Just two years after Elizabeth's coronation, however, Dudley's wife suddenly died after mysteriously falling down a flight of stairs. Dudley's wife died or was murdered in 1560. She was found at the foot of the flight of stairs. Was she murdered? The obvious theory was that Dudley had got her out of the way so he could marry Elizabeth. Dudley was later cleared of any suspicion of the murder, but it didn't stop many viewing his wife's sudden death as well-timed, to say the least. But if he now saw the way clear to marry the Queen, Elizabeth had different ideas. The relationship continued. It continued for many years and he made many attempts to get her to marry him. And in the end, he got so fed up with waiting because a man with his standing with his land wanted an heir. And so he secretly married, and Elizabeth hardly forgave him for that. She still wanted him, even though she couldn't marry him or wouldn't marry him herself. She didn't want him to marry anyone else. She was quite selfish in that respect. But they recovered their equilibrium, and they became almost like brother and sister. And when he died in 1588, just after the triumph of the Armada, she mourned him deeply. And I think if there was anyone to whom she would have surrendered herself, I think it was him. If Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester, was the man Elizabeth loved, then her dalliance with his stepson Robert Devereux, Earl of Essex, was a different kind of relationship altogether. It was his mother who became Dudley's second wife, and after Dudley's death, he made a point of replacing his stepfather in the Queen's affections. Alison Weir and Jacqueline Roth explain. Her relationship with the Earl of Essex is a curious one. How did she actually see him? He behaved like the adoring suitor. And did she see him not just as an adoring suitor, because she loved the flattery and attention of men, did she also see him as the son she had never had? It was a very strange relationship. Devereux, the Earl of Essex, was an impetuous, arrogant man. And although Elizabeth probably quite liked that about him, it also got him into trouble. He did not always show the Queen the respect that she was due, and people were quite shocked. When she argued with him on one occasion, he actually drew his sword, which would have been a pun, I mean, literally the attempted treason. It's a very serious thing. And he could have lost his right hand for trying to draw blood in, and you know, spill blood in, within the verge of the court. So it's a, it's a pretty serious thing. But he just got away with it, and she let him, and people could not understand this. Devereux's arrogance was to be his undoing. After a disastrous military campaign in Ireland, he was found guilty of desertion of duty and stripped of his status in court. 
Furious, he marched into London at the head of an armed force demanding to see the Queen. A fight broke out, he was arrested, charged with treason, and in 1601, the Tower of London saw yet another high-profile beheading. Was Elizabeth as saddened by his death as she was by Dudley's? I don't think so. I think she probably regretted losing the attention of a handsome, young, virile man. But she would have been more furious about his arrogance in daring to challenge her authority. Nobody, and especially no man, was going to do that to the Virgin Queen and get away with it. But the question remained. Given her relationship with first Dudley and then Devereux, was Elizabeth really the Virgin Queen at all? Or was the title nothing more than a brilliant bit of calculated political spin? The matter continues to divide historians today. So this is where she gets the title, the Virgin Queen. It's not because she didn't sleep with anyone at all. We know that she had affairs. We know she slept with Dudley. We know she slept with Essex. But she never married. And that's why they considered her the Virgin Queen. Personally, as a historian, I just think she was the Virgin Queen she claimed to be. But there were many rumours about her. And regarding her sobriquet, the Virgin Queen, I mean, that was probably inaccurate. We know that her relations with Robert Dudley and Lester were extremely close. Nobody can actually prove one way or the other. If Elizabeth I is remembered as the Virgin Queen, regardless of how accurate the title may have been in reality, she was also remembered as the Queen who led one of England's greatest military victories, when her Royal Navy defeated the Spanish Armada, the mighty fleet of ships sent by the Spanish King to invade the country. Spain was going to show England not only who would be the proper King of England, but what proper faith would be ruling England. Because we know that Spain is very much Catholic, and the Spanish king is Catholic. There was fear at Whitehall because in the palace, because it was felt because of the Spanish were coming, and she could have lost her throne. So it was a precarious situation. He wanted to show Elizabeth exactly, you are a bastard, you're evil, we're bigger, we're going to crush you, and we're going to return a proper king to your throne and return Catholicism to England. And that's not what happened. Peace was her chief objective, but she realized in the end that she had no choice. She had to confront the king. He was going to send his head to the Armada anyway. You know, she had to confront him. She said, I'm married to England. This is my land. This is my realm. And there was never more so true than when the British Navy, well, the English Navy, really triumphed over the Spanish Armada. Except, was the defeat of the Spanish Armada really the glorious military triumph it's portrayed as? Or is this, like the cult of the Virgin Queen, another example of Elizabeth's talent for self-mythologizing? Here's Richard Fitzwilliams. I think she was largely symbolic. One does have to remember the actual, these were unwieldy ships. The sailors were not very experienced. The troops on them were absolutely useless. If they couldn't come to close quarters with the English, which they couldn't because they were huge. Also, there was one battle, the Battle of Gravelines, which showed that the English could fire at long distances and it is thought that the whole concept of sending such unwieldy ships with aristocrats in command, with cannon that couldn't really fire, it has been thought that the Armada hardly fired at all. It was just completely unwieldy. The Spanish may have sent a huge armada to conquer England, but the ships they used were unsuited to the task. The smaller, faster English ships, commanded by experienced sailor Sir Francis Drake, were able to outmaneuver them, and their clever use of burning fire ships left much of the Armada sitting ducks. But most crucially, Elizabeth was also helped by something no monarch could command the weather. Some would say the victory should be attributed to what was called the Protestant wind. The sea played up, the winds came in, and that's really the factor that helped the English overcome the Spanish Armada. The winds actually blew the Spanish ships northward around the English coast, 
and scuppered their attempts to invade. And it was only by a fluke that that happened. I mean, the Spanish outnumbered the English. But the one thing the English really had going for it was their naval prowess, really, and knowing the sea and knowing English weather. And it was, to be honest with you, it wasn't the military might of the English boats. It was really that nature was on the side of the English and all that had happened. The whole thing degenerated into a form of a farce because there didn't seem to be any plan that would work to begin with. I think it was a completely impractical expedition. I mean, it ended up as a form of a rout and disaster. The defeat of the Spanish Armada was the crowning achievement of Elizabeth's reign. And typically, whether or not her victory had more to do with Spanish incompetence and lucky weather than any action she had taken, the Virgin Queen was quick to exploit it to add to her own mythology and create what's now called the Golden Age. And following that, it is known as the Golden Age of England because England prospered. The extraordinary flowering of literature and drama, the fact that it produced William Shakespeare, our greatest playwright, the likes of Marlowe and Johnson, Decker, Kidd, this whole period that I think is pretty well unique in, in our, our history of drama. England was just sowing the seeds for colonialism and setting out on all of these different paths and conquering the new world and setting out to establish colonies and bringing back things to Britain, such as potatoes and tobacco and all of these other things. So setting the seeds and putting in motion these cogs that have made the world turn really in a very British way from that age has helped build this British brand. Also of interest, I think, is the fact that paintings by Nicholas Hilliard and others show her with her alabaster mask, usually with her hand on the globe, or the Spanish Armada being defeated in the background and so on. And for the Armada, the epitaph was, God blew the winds and they scattered. And the obvious focus is Elizabeth. The fact that Elizabeth represents God on earth, and the fact that it's through her that England remained firstly an independent country and secondly actually survived. And that's why even today the United Kingdom, the British are number one in soft power around the world. That's just the way it is. So we do have Elizabeth I to thank for really setting England on a course that would lead to everything good that England, the United Kingdom and Great Britain has had over the centuries. The image of the Virgin Queen, the image of where she sacrificed for her country, the image of Gloriana, who was glorious. Queen Elizabeth I died on March 24th, 1603, aged 69. She had risen from the bastard daughter of an executed mother to ruler of England for 45 years as perhaps the most celebrated monarch in its history. She could also be said to have set the foundations for the modern royal brand, the firm that defines and controls how we see the monarchy, and that places the importance of that brand above all else. I do think she was a remarkable woman and a great survivor. But there's little doubt that she left in Britain and in the wider world in subsequent centuries this aura and that was a wonderfully skillful building up of image. She'd overcome threats, many threats from plots to unseat her on behalf of Mary Queen of Scots, her chief rival, and she'd overcome the threat posed by the Spanish Armada, fleet invasion fleet sent by Philip of Spain in 1588 to conquer England. So she was the world's greatest survivor. Elizabeth's self-mythologizing cult of the Virgin Queen meant that she died childless, and so she was succeeded by James I, the son of her great rival Mary Queen of Scots. But her brilliant manipulation of her own image and extraordinary sense of how to use it to her advantage, regardless of what the truth might have been, means that ultimately she did achieve a kind of immortality denied to other monarchs. When forced to choose between the truth and the legend, 
Elizabeth not only chose the legend, she created it. She was seen as the great monarch, good Queen Bess, and the legend is still perpetrated today. Next time on The Firm, Blood, Lies and Royal Succession. Madness. The day after his Golden Jubilee, he fell into his fifth attack of manic depression and he went completely insane. He was totally divorced from reality. I mean, he had to be restrained. Foaming at the mouth, needing to be held down. He was swearing. He spoke continually for 24 hours on one occasion. Sometimes he would want to take off his dressing gown and run around the corridors naked or go outside the castle and run through the fields naked. He was a person who I think has been completely misunderstood by history because of two things. Recently, Hamilton the Musical, in which he's held up to be the sort of personification of evil, really, and also the Declaration of Independence, which makes some 28 charges against him, 26 of which I believe to be rubbish. And the most misunderstood king in British history. And his story is so sad because he was literally a stroke of the pen away from resigning his post, from abdicating of being king. The Firm, Blood Lies and Royal Succession is a production of Audology, a division of Empire Media Group. The series is hosted by me, Jonathan Locke. Executive producers are Dylan Howard and Melissa Cronin. The series is written by Dominic Utton, reporting by Douglas Montero, mixing and sound design by Sean Kravitz. Please subscribe to The Firm wherever you get your podcasts, and if you like what you hear, leave us a rating, review, and tell your friends.